Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, in the name of God Almighty, most gracious, most merciful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for uh, joining me this evening um, to hear what I've got to say about the gun merchants of the frontier. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, um, Dara is situated in um, the tribal region which is known as Fata. Of course, you read the news, so you're quite familiar with it. Um, it's governed under what is known as the Frontier Crimes Regulation Act of 1901. It's a based on a concept of collective responsibility and collective punishment. And I talk about this because this is the environment in which people operate, business operates over there, etc. And supporters claim that the FCR is um, draconian, while others say that really it's within the spirit of tribal culture and law. The political agent is the main chap who is in charge from the government side of it. He reports directly to the FATA Secretariat. And there are various things that he can undertake to keep the tribes under control. Uh, basically operates through a council of elders, the Jirga. Um, and um, most of the decisions as far as the tribes are concerned is made by the Jirga, which settles disputes and whatever. is basically the role of the political agent to make sure that whatever decisions are taken is in line with government uh, policy. Um, he enforces um, his control uh, through tribal levies and the frontier court, which is now 60,000 strong. This was the system that existed till, of course, there was, um, uh, after 9-11, uh, when there was a very radical change in the system that existed within FATA. Uh, historically, uh, there were a number of small arm markets uh, within the region of Fata, from Bajor in the north to Miram Shah and Jandola in South Waziristan. But of course, the one that's appeared as the most prominent is Dara Adam Khel. Uh, Dara means pass, Adam Khel is a sub tribe of the Afridis. So it's the pass of the Afridis. Sounds very Scottish if you just translate it into that sort of thing. So let's step back about a um, hundred years or so into time and see how Dara emerged in the whole business of gun running uh, in the frontier. And this was a statement that I came across um, in my research where it says that basically it was the British who set up or allowed this place to be set up uh, because um, you know the Pathans would then start making their own guns instead of smuggling and stealing them from elsewhere and actually this is not true. It's far from the truth. Um, till about the 1890s, the tribals were basically using uh, the good old um, swords and uh, jezels um, in the combat against the Sikhs and subsequently against the British. But it was the Afridi expedition of 1877, and for the first time they came across um, breech-loading rifles. Rapid fire, effective up to about 800 to 1,000 uh, yards, and they realized that the nature of warfare had changed. And it says the boring of barrels is an art, hand forged on a common anvil, and you can see from this picture that even in the 1950s it was pretty rustic. Um, the power was provided by a man turning a big uh, wheel. A lot of belts looked something out of the Industrial Revolution a hundred years uh, earlier. The, this gentleman is checking the accuracy of the barrel. So basically what did they do? They produced the good old 303 rifle for the tribals and um, shotguns, etc., for the domestic market within Pakistan. And of course, what changed all that was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and some different sorts of arms started filtering in. As you can see from the picture on the right bottom, uh, the old 303 in the initial stages of the war was very much uh, a weapon of use. But the rocket launcher, the RPG, had also appeared. What was the negative impact of the Soviet invasion? Of course, there was a declaration of jihad which shifted the center of gravity away from the tribal jirgas, um, uh, the tribes and the, the uh, uh, tribal leaders uh, to the mullah. 
because he was the guy from the pulpit and the loudspeaker who called in the mosque called for the jihad. And the conservative system that I had talked about of the political agents in the Jirgan, of course, couldn't cope with the changed environment. And a lot of new actors came into the scene, including the KGB and CAD and the CIA and the Indian Raw and, and of course, the ISI. And it disturbed the delicate balance that um, had been there for about a good hundred years, the time of the British Raj. Um, in fact, um, there was a lovely story that one of my friends told me, uh, you know, after the Geneva Accord was signed, um, there were uh, UN monitoring teams on both sides of the border uh, to monitor the Accord, and invariably from Kabul, a report used to be sent saying that a caravan was moving in a day or so from some such location, it was being assembled, the intelligence information was picked up, and this chap used to actually work with the UN Observer Group over here, and his task was to take them there, but delay them sufficiently so that the evidence would not be uh, seen. And um, so there was this report of about a thousand mules, which were uh, up north of Chitral. Uh, he took them up in a helicopter. Uh, conveniently, the road was blocked halfway up, so they had to walk the last five, seven kilometers. They arrived there, this caravan of a thousand mules was no longer there. But of course, what you couldn't hide was the mule droppings of a thousand mules. I mean, the area was uh, littered by that. Anyway, um, because of the Soviet invasion, uh, there was an influx of uh, very different sorts of weapons now into the right from the 23 millimeter cannon to the 30 millimeter automatic grenade launcher and a variety of other smaller stuff. But of course, the uh, most prized was the Stinger, um, which they say was uh, responsible ultimately for the Soviet uh, deciding to pull out from Afghanistan. Actually, there were many other reasons for that. But uh, that was what was used to knock down the Hinds, which were very feared by the Mujahideen. And of course, the uh, person who was directly responsible for getting the stingers into the hands of the Mujahideen was our friend Charlie Wilson. Um, and the influence on Charlie Wilson was this lady called Joanna Herring, who is cons our Consul General in Houston, Texas. Um, there was a relationship between her and Charlie Wilson, but of course there was a very working relationship between her and uh, President Zayal Haq. But she, she was a, a strong lady, and uh, General Zayal Haq had a lot of regards for her. Um, and uh, I'm told that in a, um, if you, even if he was in a cabinet meeting or something, and her call came, he used to leave that and go and uh, talk to her, because she was very influential, uh, particularly with uh, Charlie Wilson. Anyway, after the end of the uh, Soviet invasion, there was a buyback program to get back all the stingers that had not yet been uh, fired, um, and the U.S. was offering a fairly large amount for those uh, weapons. Um, there was a very uh, interesting uh, tribal, um, uh, one of the Mujahideen group leaders from uh, the Paktia province, um, whose brother was actually arrested in, uh, in Quetta, uh, because uh, they had a consignment of stingers that they were trying to ex smuggle to Iran. The, when the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, there were large caches of ammunition that they left behind, particularly in northern Afghanistan, because they wanted to keep uh, them well armed against uh, the Pathans um, and the South. And in fact, uh, when I was dealing with defense export at that time, there was a requirement from uh, one of the um, second line forces in Pakistan uh, for grenade launchers. So I talked to the Dara people and they supplied 30 automatic grenade launchers and 50,000 rounds of ammunition. Um, they took about six months collecting it. Where it came from over the border, I don't know, but probably from northern Afghanistan and some of the ammunition was still factory packed. I mean, the Soviet, whatever the Soviet. A very strange looking yellow color, their boxes used to be, the ammunition boxes, all sealed. Um, 
a lot of smuggling coming in from Turkmenistan down into the Helmand province, basically guns for um, drugs. Um, one kilogram of heroin uh, will fetch 30 AK-47s in Turkmenistan and it will only buy you six. So there is that much difference um, in the price and therefore it makes it more luc much lucrative to smuggle it down into Helmand province. And of course there is also Iran, a lot of smuggling going across the Iran border. From northern Afghanistan come the heavy weapons. Um, from Tajikistan come the more sophisticated. And from Iran come the rockets and the mines. And a lot of these mines, of course, are used uh, for IEDs, the uh, improvised explosive devices that are uh, planted on the uh, roadsides. Um, by the way, this mine, um, a lot of the mines they find there are stuff that was originally supplied uh, are of Italian design that were originally supplied to the uh, Mujahideen during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, there is other smaller stuff which is coming from Europe, um, more sophisticated things like telescopes for sniper rifles, etc. Okay, final two slides. Um, you know there was a period in 2007 and 2008 where the Taliban just about had control of Dara and they were patrolling its streets. In fact, they were tapping at the doors of Peshawar. And at that time, business in Dara came to a practical standstill. Uh, ultimately, the army had to uh, go in. There was a lot of fighting. Um, in fact, the uh, friendship tunnel was bombed a good two or three times by the uh, Taliban to stop the flow of traffic. Um, there was a lot of extortion, kidnapping, bombing that carried on. And it gave uh, actually an impetus to uh, the frontier government to do something that they've been trying to do for a long time. And that is to shift the business from Dara up to uh, the Pishar, where it can come under government control. But Dara is in the front of Frater area, as I said, uh, in the beginning. So they've given certain incentives, incentives, manufacturing licenses, uh, the fees have been reduced, tax-free import of machinery. And so while Dara is still there and it's functioning, uh, but it's more of a distribution center uh, as opposed to manufacturing. A lot of the manufacturing uh, for, um, I think, for the better reason has shifted to uh, Peshawar. 